aliens bursting out of our chests, worms crawling under our skin and de deforming our bodies, and puppet masters tapping into our brains, modifying our behaviors, and turning us into automatons or into zombies. Parasites have inspired more than their fair share of horrific imagery. And indeed, some of them are kind of horrible. Um, parasites such as this scary looking hookworm here infect, infect billions of people worldwide, exacting a cruel toll of um, hardship and suffering. And it's usually in the context of disease and harm that we hear about parasites. Um, but is that really the whole story? I would argue that parasites, to some extent, suffer from an identity crisis, <laughs> a bad rap. Um, and I think part of that stems from the way that we define parasitism in the first place. Organisms like us, in fact, in most organisms, um, are hosts to a vast community of other organisms that live on or inside us. And for the most part, those organisms are benign. In some cases, they're actually helpful. But by definition, those that cause harm, those that exploit us in some way, we call parasites. The notion that the host is harm is integral to how we define parasites in the first place. So of course, it's perfectly normal that when we hear the word parasite, we react with disgust and uh, suspicion, perhaps. <laughs> I saw it outside. Um, and uh, we think, well, maybe it might be a good thing to eradicate these parasites. Now, when people find out that I'm a parasitologist, they always assume that my research centers on how to eradicate them. And they're always very surprised to find out that I don't want to eradicate them at all, and that I actually find them fascinating and curious and interesting to study. Um, and they always tell me things like, how could you work on something like this? Uh, wouldn't it just be better to eradicate them all? Wouldn't it be better to just get rid of them? Wouldn't it be better if the world were just rid of them? Well, I'm here today to introduce you to some game-changing research that has completely changed how we view parasites and how we consider them. Um, and I hope that by the end of this talk, you will accept that parasites are not only important, but are fascinating and interesting and even potentially useful. Now consider the vertebrates. This is a group of animals that have a backbone. We are vertebrates. And the size of the blue boxes on the screen is proportional to the number of species in a number of recognizable vertebrate groups. So up at the top, you have the bony fishes. Then the next square down are the birds. Then you have the reptiles, the amphibians, the mammals. And then the little tiny white square on there, that's the sharks. Go sharks! <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> now, the big, gigantic red square engulfing them all is proportional to the size of the parasites that infect those vertebrates. The take home message being that parasitic organisms outnumber the free living organisms. And in fact, the more we study these systems, the more we realize that parasites make up the major part of the biodiversity in any ecosystem we've ever studied. Um, and even more interestingly, those parasites just aren't numerous. We're beginning to realize that they play critical ecological roles in those ecosystems. For instance, let's consider a really cool parasite, uh, it's a flatworm, called Euhaplorchis californiensis. Um, Euhaplorchis has a very complicated life cycle that involves three different kinds of hosts. It starts in a bird, then it goes into a snail, and then it goes into a fish, and then from there back into a bird. And it has to infect those hosts in precisely that order. Now, the adults live inside the digestive tract of a bird where they copulate, they release eggs in the feces of the bird, and if that feces falls into water, the egg hatches out into the first larval stage of this parasite, which moves along the bottom, sniffing out snail tracks. And when it finds a snail track, it moves towards the snail and it penetrates into that snail, castrating it, turning that parasite into a snail zombie parasite factory. Inside that snail, the parasite sucks all the energy out of the snail and uses it to make tens of thousands of copies of itself, which burst out of the body of the snail by the thousands like little heat-seeking missiles, only they're not seeking heat. They're seeking the next host in the life cycle, which is a fish. And when they find that fish, they drill their way into that fish, and they move towards that fish's brain, where they form cysts all around the brain, and they start micromanaging the behavior of that fish, making it do silly things, like move up <laughs> towards the surface 
where that fish doesn't want to be. And it also makes it do silly things like flashing its belly, its shiny white belly towards the surface. And that inevitably attracts the attention of birds, which come in and eat those fish. And the life cycle is beautifully closed that way. Now, here's an amazing piece of information. Infected fish are 30 times more likely to get eaten by a bird than uninfected fish. Or rather, put a different way, birds find it 30 times easier to eat in environments where the fish are infected with this parasite. Right? So it's not just that the parasite is contributing to diversity by simply being there. It's actually driving key ecological processes. When it castrates the snail, it effectively kills the snail. And it controls snail numbers in the same way that a top predator would control um, other animals, like wolves might control deer. And when it channels ecosystem energy upwards from those snails, upwards from those fish, and into those birds, it actually frees up ecosystem energy to support more birds. Right? In other words, the parasite is transforming the ecosystem in ways that we find desirable. Because while we may be a little bit iffy about parasites, we're really gung-ho about birds. <laughs> And so if the parasite is absent, if you pull it out of the system, the ecosystem supports fewer birds, and the ecosystem becomes less desirable from our perspective. Research like this is game changing, because it has completely changed the way that we view parasites. Up until recently, we viewed parasites as disgusting, as hallmarks of diseased ecosystems. But the more we study it, the more we realize that the healthiest ecosystems, the ones that are most diverse, the ones that are most desirable from our perspective, are the ones that have the healthiest and most diverse and abundant and thriving parasite communities. This is completely game changing when you think about it. Yeah. Now, of course, parasites um, aren't just um, good. Some parasites, as I said earlier, do cause a significant amount of morbidity worldwide. And we have actually gone to a lot of trouble as, as scientists to try to eradicate them. To such an extent, in fact, that um, in countries with high socioeconomic status, with good sanitation, um, uh, with uh, high rates of urbanization, parasites are really a thing of the past. If you look at this map, the distribution of the helminths, things like the round worms, so the, the tip pin worms, tape worms, um, hook worms, uh, whip worms, and so on, is largely confined to uh, countries with relatively low socioeconomic status. The countries with high socioeconomic status are essentially parasite free, which is a good thing, right? Of, of course it is. Uh, the, the, these, the lack of a parasite free lifestyle is, uh, leads to better long term health and, uh, and better quality of life and things like that. But recent research is starting to show that the eradication of parasites in these high socioeconomic status countries may have come at a significant cost. Because as we eradicate parasites from these areas, we start seeing an increase in the, in the emergence of these new chronic illnesses, illnesses like multiple sclerosis, asthma, and inflammatory bowel disease. And what these so-called Western diseases have in common is that, first of all, they're all but absent in places in the world where parasites are still a problem. And second of all, they all involve a strong autoimmune component. They are caused by the body attacking its own cells. So why does that happen? Well, a very compelling theory that might explain why this happens is called the hygiene hypothesis. Simply put, our immune systems have evolved over millions of years um, in the context where our bodies are under constant assault by pathogens of all types, viruses, bacteria, parasites. And these systems have evolved such a level of sophistication that specific insults specific challenges trigger very specific responses. For instance, challenge the body with an, with an intracellular pathogen such as a virus and the Th1 part of the adaptive immune system response. Conversely, if you challenge the body with something larger like a parasite, it's the Th2 branch of that adaptive immune system that gets stimulated. And this whole thing gets regulated by a large number of regulatory cells that all communicate with each other with these small molecules called cytokines. The point being that the system is very, very sophisticated. But here's the catch. The system starts off naive. It has to be trained. And if we don't train that system, 
by being periodically exposed to parasites and to uh, other illnesses, during, especially during our early childhood, the system doesn't mature properly. And instead of uh, responding only to appropriate stimuli, occasionally start responding to inappropriate stimuli like pollen, peanuts, and even our own cells. And this in turn might lead to allergies, asthma, and autoimmune disorders. Okay. Now one of the interesting predictions of the hygiene hypothesis is that if the eradication of parasites is what causes these illnesses, then perhaps these illnesses might be treatable by deliberately administering parasites to the patients that are suffering from these illnesses. Right? And uh, I could see a few <laughs> uncertain looks in the audience, I understand that. But the, the interesting thing is that this is not a new idea. In fact, the um, treatment of terminal syphilis by deliberately infecting patients with malaria one, the developer of that particular technique, the Nobel Prize in Medicine back in 1927. So this is definitely not a new idea. Now, I'm not advocating that we deliberately infect people with malaria. That might be a bit harsh. But we do have relatively non-pathogenic alternatives, such as this whipworm. And there's, this, in fact, has led to the emergence of an entirely new area in experimental medicine called helminthic therapy, where we attempt to treat these autoimmune diseases by de deliberately infecting people with worms such as these whipworms. Now, the research is still at a very early stage, and in fact, it isn't even approved for clinical use uh, in, uh, in the United States. But it's been tried elsewhere, and the initial results are quite prom <laughs> promising. And we've noticed um, distinct improvements in outcomes for patients suffering from things like asthma and irritable, ir uh, irritable bowel disease and so on. So the technique is promising. And certainly the fact that you can alleviate some of the symptoms of these diseases by treating people with parasites lends some support to the idea that the hygiene hypothesis might be at least in part responsible uh, for the, um, the emergence of these autoimmune disorders. Okay. So now I'd like to bring you back to the original question that I, that I was asked when I, you know, when I come out as a parasitologist. People say, Two things. First of all, they say, why can't we just get rid of them? Why don't we just eliminate them all? And uh, to that, I hope I've sort of helped spread the idea that parasites are important contributors to biodiversity, and they help drive ecosystem processes, and they do so in ways that are often very desirable to us. And certainly, some parasites cause harm, and certainly, as scientists, we should do our best to try to get rid of them. But when we do so, we should be mindful of the fact that when we eradicate parasites, this comes with a cost, that we are effectively treating short-term, acute, parasitic, infectious diseases with longer-term, chronic, autoimmune diseases. And ironically, we now find ourselves using these parasites that we've been trying to eradicate for centuries in medical treatments to treat the autoimmune disorders that arise because we eradicated the parasites in the first place. It's, a, it's an interesting irony. Why do we study parasites? Well, I would suggest that in the studying, and by studying parasites and their relations to us, their hosts, we will get some insights into how these parasites interact with their hosts and maybe get some ideas about how to treat some of these autoimmune disorders. Autoimmune disorders that arise when parasites get lost. Thank you. <laughs>